All right, welcome to another edition of Scope TV. Tonight we have on the phone a true music mogul, Rich Isaacson. Rich, how you doing tonight? I'm doing great, thanks. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Westchester County, New York. Okay. Enjoying the uh, Martin Luther King Day holiday? Yep. Yeah. Watching CNN and watching all the pundits talk about what's going to happen. <laughs> So let's get into this uh, interview. You've had a very close working relationship with Steve Rifkin. What what has that relationship meant to you in regards to the music industry? It's everything. Um, Steve and I grew up together, and um, basically since we were kids, we always talked about being in business together. And um, and one day it really happened, and uh, I went into business with him. He started a marketing company, and then he got the first. so many bands in, in various genres. Uh, what would you say it is about your vision and intuition that you see in an MC or a band that the rest of the world just simply cannot? Um, I, don't, I don't think I have any special skills in that regard. I think I just know what I like. And when I like something, I chase it. And I don't think anybody, there's, there's very few people that I've come across in the music industry in over in almost 20 years, 18 years, that are right all the time or even right most of the time. The the best ones are right often enough, you know. Mm. Um, I just know what I like and I just chase what I like and and when you chase what you like and you believe in it and you work hard, then you get lucky, you know. And then you work hard when you get lucky and you get lucky again. And that's how I feel. I feel like there's a lot of great bands out there and I chase what I like, you know, and I like something it motivates me to work hard, and when you work hard, good things happen. That's cool. So what is it about music um, that makes it one of the most powerful marketing mediums, which you and Steve have been very successful with, um, merging the two so well? What, what is it about music that makes that such a perfect medium for that? Well, I, th I think people just, music touches people in different ways. It, it either reminds you of something, it connects you to something, it evokes a feeling. Um, it, 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 it bonds you with something. It, it, any any number of different emotions or feelings, or, or it could just be as simple as you like the way it sounds, or you like the way it makes you feel, or you like the way it makes you, you know, when you're, you're in a bad mood and it kind of takes you, lets you be in a bad mood, or it lets you be in a, you know, suffering mood, or it elevates you, you know. And I think that's brands and marketers you know, realize how obvious that is, that you want to connect to a consumer, and music is one of those universal things that that's an, an easy way to connect with someone. You know, a, a famous song or, or a, a well-known um, artist connects to people, and that takes you right there. So I think that's pretty simple. That's cool. What is the biggest difference between launching a group like, like Mob Deep or Exhibit or Wu-Tang or even Big Pun Launching them now as opposed to how it was back back in the 90s? Well, I think it's really different. I, I think our, the reason why we were really successful at Loud with those artists was we were smart enough to know what we did know and smart enough to know what we didn't know. What we knew was those artists all had amazing talent. Um, and what we didn't know was, uh, what we also knew is let them do their thing and, and surround them with a staff and surround them with an army and help execute their vision. You know, whether it was RZA or the guys from Mob Deep or Big Pun or Exhibit, 
so many active ventures that you have. Uh, under under your umbrella, what what's your most effective practice that you use to balance everything and and keep your momentum going day by day? Organization. Okay. Uh, you know, I, what I do at the end of the day is manage, whether it's managing a business or managing an artist's career or uh, managing a staff. It's basically organization and focus, and you know, constantly going over. Okay, what do I need to do today? What do we need to accomplish this month? What do we need to accomplish uh, this year with whoever my client is, whether it's the, you know SRC, the record company that I run with Steve and Gabby Acevedo, or whether it's Mika's career that I co-manage with two partners, or whether it's a publishing company that I run. You know, I talk to my partners, I talk to who, who the artists that I work with, and you know, my job is to constantly keep everybody focused on what we're trying to achieve and help execute. And that's waking up early every morning and putting a list together. This is what I have to do today. These are the people I have to call. These are the people that need to do this. You know, and, and, and that's really what it comes down to. It's pretty simple. You know, you show up and you work hard and you surround yourself with smart people and uh, people who share your vision. And uh, this isn't a hard business to succeed in if you work hard and you, and you do those things, in my opinion. And then you get lucky, you know. It's obviously okay. working. That's for sure. Do you ever worry that there'll be too much marketing in music, like product placement and lyrics, and that can maybe backfire and turn fans off? Where do you draw the line between artistic creativity and commercialism? Um, I think you know it when you see it. You know, I mm. think there's absolutely a risk that that will happen, and that that does happen. And there's good use of music and marketing, and there's bad music use of music and marketing and when 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 it's forced or when it looks just smells wrong or it just looks wrong that's when it's wrong I don't think you can define it you know it's kind of like uh, pornography when one of the Supreme Court justices said he couldn't define pornography but he knows it when he sees it I think it's the same thing with regard to excess marketing with music you know you just know it when you see it sometimes it fits and sometimes it's just a force that's cool so in, in regards to SRC, another uh, artist you have, Asher Roth. How do you feel when the press and uh, some of the fans try to pigeonhole Asher Roth as the next Eminem? And it, was that part of your decision to sign him, or, or what was behind that, that acquisition? Um, I think Steve just saw it. I wasn't, I wasn't actually there when he got signed. He, was, he came to the office, and he, he wrapped his ass off, and Steve just fell in love with him and signed him because he was impressed with his skills. I don't think, obviously, you know, there haven't been a, a great uh, many successful white rappers, so any time a white guy raps, you're going to compare him to the most successful white rapper who's Eminem. And I guess if you ask Asher Ross, he'd say he'd be flattered to, could be, to be compared to, you know, one of the most successful and most respected MCs, but you also don't want to be defined by that or limited by it. So I think that's, you know, that makes sense that anybody would compare a, a white rapper to a, another white rapper, but it's also kind of the obvious thing to do. You know, they're, they're, they, you know, Asher Ross coming from a different place, and he's talking about different things. And, um, you know, he's, he's not Eminem. He's not trying to be Eminem. Um, he, they, they have one thing in common, their skin color. You know, that's kind of uh, a limited way for people to look at things. But, you know, that's expected in a way. That's cool. Uh, just uh, for, the, for the fans at home listening in, we are going to uphold to the YouTube standards. Quick, take, take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Hold on one second. 